very lucky to get and come out and kill a bunch of them. Um, but it was it was a, it has been a real treat. And then we got to also go looking for mammals. Um, so we spent a bunch of time uh, putting out live and snap traps, trying to get an idea of what type of diversity we have around here. Um, and the, the mammal trapping was a little bit inconclusive because we were specifically looking for a couple of different, one a harvest mouse, which is a mouse, they live in Alberta and there's been records of their fur found in Saskatchewan. Um, but we were unable to find the whole thing. So we're still trying. We also collected a lot of, um, collected a lot of uh, owl pellets. So if anyone has some of those uh, square green bins, that the roofs come off every once in a while and they usually got a little support structure right in the middle. And those things are usually filled with owl pellets. So we went and tried to collect as many of those as we could to figure out what the owls are eating because that's actually the best way to find small mammals. Uh, and then the third group of animals we spent a lot of time with was with, with the reptiles, particularly the snakes. And uh, so this is more of a pet project for, for me and the, the rest of the crew because we were all fairly, um, fairly keen on snakes. Snake freaks. Snake freaks, yes. <laughs> And we happened to be working for a snake freak, so it worked out okay. Because he, see, he, indul he indulged our obsessions. Um, but we were particularly lucky with the snakes, especially in terms of uh, east block diversity. So we were able to find a rattlesnake just uh, just by the sinking hill. So that, although I'm sure it doesn't surprise a lot of you guys that there's still rattlesnakes around, it certainly surprised the guys at the museum because they haven't been out for a long time. So. Um, they were pretty excited about that, and then of course, um, when our boss came down to come and see the rattlesnake, uh, we found it had been eaten by a badger. So, <laughs> there may or may not be rattlesnakes left in Sinking Hill, but I have a feeling there's probably more if there's one. Uh, we also put a couple of radio transmitters and some bull snakes uh, to try and find out where they're spending the winters, because uh, a couple groups have come down to East Block in, in the area. Um, looking for hibernation sites where they can track snakes to and from and actually get some decent numbers because if you want to actually get a trend you need more than one snake and you might have a slightly aberrant snake. Um, so we went and tracked a couple and so hopefully in another month or so when they all end up at their den sites we'll uh, we'll be able to follow them there and hopefully find some more and then maybe we'll be able to put to rest whether there's still some rattlesnakes and racers as well. Uh, we were also able to find a hognose snake which I don't know if any of you guys have ever seen a hognose snake. I didn't bring uh, any of those because there's not very many of them here. But uh, we were able to find one just just south of McGowan's. Um, and they're a pretty neat snake. They, they tend to be a, a toad-eating snake, although they will eat just about anything small. Um, and uh, the neat thing about them is they play dead. So if you <laughs> bug them, you poke them and bother them, they'll, they'll pretend to be, this, people call them puff adders towards uh, in Manitoba, where I, I spent a bunch of time working on them, they, they puff up and they, they flatten their necks like a cobra and they strike mercilessly, but they never actually bite you. And, uh, and then if that doesn't work, if you keep poking at them, they just flip over and stick their tongues out and pretend to be dead. <laughs> and that's their, that's their brilliant, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's it, that's the, full, that's the full works. So we were pretty lucky to find one of those. And then we also had a bunch of reports of smooth green snakes, which uh, according to the museum, they stopped at Kildeer. Um, but we found them all the way over uh, past Four Corners and, and through the Badlands. So uh, they're there too. So we had a very successful summer in terms of that. But it was also really good because we were able to apply some of the local knowledge. I mean, museums are great for knowing the, the scientific name of things, but they don't always know where to look. And museums have historically, when they've been looking in Canada, they've gone for one to two weeks, they've been very focused, they're gonna, you know, we're gonna find a rattlesnake. And they go and they look. But in a place like Saskatchewan, where so much of our diversity is really hidden, I mean, it, you, it's not like you're going to the African savanna and you've got, you know, all this big megafauna anymore. We've got tons of diversity, lots of neat things, but they're hidden. You don't see them every day unless you're really, really looking, or you spend days and days and days out there. The only reason we saw all the things we did is because we spent every day walking 20, 30 kilometers. And, you know, we got some luck as well. It's, it's stumbling across things more than research. Um, so we were really happy to do that. I mean, yesterday, for example, 
Uh, my wife and I are packing up to move back to West Block and I'm catching a plane. Um, so we couldn't leave the house yesterday. But by the end of the day, we'd still seen a new species that neither one of us had ever seen before because there's some bats in the garage. I mean, it was, we, we, we found Western small-footed myotis. I'd never seen uh, uh, that species of bat before. And that was just, that was just cleaning house. You know, so if you, if you get out every day and walk around, it's pretty amazing what we got to see. Our bosses were pretty jealous. But uh, like I said, we, we had a really, really good summer here. And I owe a lot of thanks to all the people that have given us tips and help and information and cake. <laughs> it's a cake. And it was just, we've, we've had a wonderful time. And I think we had a, a good one. And uh, hopefully, we'll, in a couple of months, when they bother to go through some of the weirder bees, uh, we'll have an idea of what sort of animals we actually saw. Because although the snakes were most exciting for me, and the mammals were pretty cool, uh, the bees are probably what's going to actually be the most interesting thing because I have a feeling we'll find a bunch of new species to the province. Um, so we're, I'm really looking forward to hearing how that went. But on that note, I just want to, um, so some people might not like certain animals, so please feel free to not pass them on. But um, I got a, a couple of boxes of animals. This first one's a group of bees. Is as, I, as I was saying, there's so much diversity in bees in this area. Uh, we have bees that represent just about every lifestyle. There's some that you might not want in your house because they burrow into wood. There's others that make uh, mud houses. There's others that don't make any houses at all and in fact parasitize on other bees that are closely related to them. And it, they call them cuckoo bees because they literally they behave like cuckoos. They go and lay their eggs in the nests of other bees and have the other bees take care of them. And that, that's, that's evolved a number of times in bees. Actually, for almost every, for almost every taxonomic group of bees, uh, there's a cuckoo bee that's closely related to them. So we all know the familiar bumblebees, the big, big woolly bumblebees, but there's also a couple of cuckoo bumblebees that parasitize bumblebees. And then there's those green bees that people see. There's a little black bee with a red abdomen. I think there's actually one in that box. And they parasitize them. Um, and then, they're not to mention all the important pollination they do, some very, very specific, some very, very broad. And then we have all our leaf cutter bees. So if anyone likes alfalfa bees, they're, they're the classic leaf cutter bee shape. But we have dozens of leaf cutter bees. And what, that one that hadn't been seen since the 20s was a leaf cutter bee. So, um, there's some pretty neat diversity here, and, and uh, in general, uh, Saskatchewan itself, but more so the rest of Canada, tends to undersell how important and how interesting Great Plains biodiversity is. Could I, mean, I take a look at your mice, or are they? Oh yeah, I'll they, pass those around in just one second. They're next. Yep. So yeah, Brenda won't. <laughs> I won't pass these to Brenda, but yeah, there's um, there's oh, I'm not a big fan of mice. <laughs> Anyways, I didn't, I didn't bring any deer mice though, so I thought Brenda would be okay, but apparently mice are mice. <laughs> so, yeah, I skinned these yesterday, so they're still a little bit soft, so please be careful with them. Um, but, um, they're not dead, are they? No, no, they're, they're thoroughly dead. They're dead once and then I froze them, so they're, they're dead. Um, so, uh, the, the one with the really long tail there, that is actually a jumping mouse. And so only one of those Terrifying. animals on that board is actually a mouse in the sense of taxonomy. Um, the, the one with the really long tail is a jumping mouse, but it has, there's three species of jumping mouse in North America, but their closest relative is actually a Mongolian rodent called a jerboa. So a big giant jumping rat. Um, so these guys are kind of all on their own taxonomically in North America. And then the little, the little gray guy beside there, that's an olive-backed pocket mouse. And that's actually more closely related to kangaroo rats. It's not a mouse either. And their claim to fame, they're desert specialists. So they, they come uh, just a little bit further north than here. But their, their, tra their thing that they do, their party, party gift, is they, cr they have cheeks, that's the name, that are lined with fur on the outside of their jaw that have skin in between the jaw and so they never lose any saliva of water to the seeds that they eat. So they'll stuff their seeds, their pockets go all the way to their shoulders, and they'll stuff their seeds till they actually have trouble moving. 
Um, and then they will go back to their burrows and unload their cheeks. And at no point will they lose any water to the seeds. And the seeds stay nice and dry, so they'll store for the winter. Are so they, they using their paws to unload? Yep, they'll use, they'll use their paws, and they'll also clean the inside of their cheek. And they actually can invert the cheek pouches too, just to get the last of the cha chaff off. So they're pretty neat. I actually, um, I, I did catch one actually right by, um, right by McGowan's one night when I was going to look for a spade-footed toad because they were calling in, in uh, during the storms in May. And uh, Brendan wanted me to bring one for the school group. And I saw this mouse running along the side of the road, which is where you usually find all the back pocket mice. They tend to like road edges. Um, and I chased it down and I caught it. And I was all proud of myself for running this mouse down. And then I was reading through trying to get a little bit more information about pocket mice. And it turns out that they're North America's slowest rodent. <laughs> so I, I immediately had the wind taken out of my sails. But I still got her. Anyways, she's, that's not her, but uh, she was a little bit bigger. But uh, they're also very interesting just because they never have to drink. They get all of their moisture from the dry seeds that they eat. And they tend to forage on seeds once they've already fallen off the stem. So they sift around in the dirt and sand with their, their fairly long claws and they cram that into their cheeks. So they're a very neat little mouse. And then the third one there, I'm pretty sure you guys, anybody that's been into a, a yard or any other place where there's wild grasses and whatnot would probably recognize a field mouse or a, what, what their, their correct um, common name is a meadow vole. So you can tell a vole by their small tails. But they're actually the only one on that whole board that's actually related to mice in any way. It's just, they all look like mice. So it gives an idea of some of the diversity that we have in this area. This is just the beginning. We have another couple of voles. Uh, we have another jumping mouse there here. That's a western. There's also a meadow jumping mouse. Um, and then we have a, a, a couple other uh, common mice, including the grasshopper mouse, which is, unfortunately, I don't have one skinned, um, but they're a very, very interesting mouse um, in that they, thank you. Look at the in that grasshopper mice, although the name would suggest they're a jumper or whatnot, grasshopper mice are actually predaceous mice. So picture uh, a, a jacked up deer mouse that's been injecting steroids. Um, make them about the same length as a, as a, as a deer mouse, but make them about twice the size, with big shoulders and a husky <laughs> neck. And then make them predaceous on grasshoppers and other mice. These are mice that will hunt down and kill other mice. Uh, and what's even neater about them than, than one of the more interesting behaviors they do is you go out onto a flat, so they like um, fairly short crop grass, so grazing is really good for grasshopper mice. Um, usually they like sort of a little bit of gravel, gravelly substrate, um, but if you go out in an area like that on a still night with no moon, you can actually hear them howl. And so they, they stand on their haunches and they buck their heads up and they howl like little tiny wolves. And that, that makes them, well, other than the pocket mice, that's probably my favorite mammal in this area just because they are the most braggadocious little mouse. If you had to give a personality, they have a swagger when you watch them walk. I've watched them at night um, in the West Block primarily, um, but they'll be walking along and they don't care whether you're watching them. They don't hurry up, they don't run away, they don't scurry away, they just swagger. There's no, there's nothing that, nothing about a grasshopper mouse that isn't bravado.